It's a very discouraging and, 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 and tragic template that was set in the 1930s of, of violence both against Jews and among themselves that doesn't even, doesn't even lead to any kind of diplomatic gains. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Thanks for joining us. Today, we have a fascinating conversation with historian Orrin Kessler, author of an important and, I might say, timely new book about the conflict between Jews and Arabs in what was then Palestine in the 1930s and the way those events foreshadowed what would follow and should inform our understanding of the contemporary struggle between Israel and the Palestinian Arabs. But before we start, I want to encourage everyone to like this video and podcast, subscribe to JNS, and click on the bell for notifications. Also, we would love to hear from you. Please write to us at editor at JNS.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. I also want to remind you that you don't have to wait a full week for more top story analysis. There is a daily top story podcast where I share more news and analysis with you about the most significant issues we're facing today. You can find The Daily Show under Top Story with Jonathan Tobin on the JNS channel on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. And now to today's program. Each instance of bloody Palestinian terrorism is a unique tragedy in which the lives of the victims have been sacrificed on the altar of Arab intransigence and an unwillingness to come to terms with the legitimacy and the permanence of the Jewish presence and Jewish sovereignty anywhere in the land of Israel. But each incident, whether it involves shootings, stabbings, car rammings, and other deadly assaults, is also terribly familiar. These sorts of events in which violence against Jews, whether planned or carried out as random acts by individuals, results in injuries and fatalities and has been going on for a century or more. But those who cover the conflict for the corporate liberal media, as well as even some Jewish outlets, often speak and write of instances of terrorism without placing it in any kind of historical context. For many journalists, history is what happened yesterday, and ancient history, the events of the day before yesterday, or at best, last week or last month. Lost in most discussions of the conflict or any mentioned of the events of the post-Oslo period, in which Israel repeatedly offered the Palestinian leadership compromises and an independent state, albeit on condition of ending their war against Zionism, or what happened in 2000 or 2008, or even during the Obama administration, let alone the aftermath of the Six-Day War or the Israeli War of Independence or the UN Partition Plan of 1947, in which the Arabs also refused the possibility of peace with Israel, even if it meant an Arab state in part of the country as well. Similarly, lost in those discussions, are the dilemmas that Jews face in determining how to respond to irredentist terror that is still rooted in the unwillingness to compromise with Zionism that goes back through a century of conflict. Must the response be one of forbearance? Can Jewish actions and offers, even the most generous imaginable, short of suicide, ever succeed in satisfying the Palestinians or even forestall terror? Must this frustration and the toll of violence always lead to a hardening of hearts in which retaliation, though it be deeply wrong, senseless, as well as lawless, becomes the inevitable result of what is wrongly termed a cycle of violence between the parties, but which might better be described as a cycle of mag Palestinian magical thinking as they continue to wish away the last several decades of history. More to the point. Just as the media is ignorant of history and the Palestinians seem committed to reversing history, 
are Israelis and Jews capable of learning from it and coming to some understandings about the intractable nature of a conflict in which the two sides' minimum demands for the Jews, a Jewish state living on living in peace and security, and for the Palestinians, no Jewish state, no matter where its borders might be drawn, cannot be reconciled, no matter how committed the Jews might be to the concept of peace. We can't know the answers to those questions, but we do know that the best way to arrive at some understanding of the present ongoing stalemate is to learn and draw conclusions from the history of the last century. One of the episodes in the story of this conflict that is least written about and perhaps least understood is the drama that unfolded in the late 1930s during what is known as the Great Arab Revolt as the Jews, Arabs, and the British rulers of the land engage in a political and military battle that Orrin Kessler, the author of the new book, Palestine 1936, The Great Revolt and the Roots of the Middle East Conflict, made the later triumph argues that made the later triumph of Zionism and the defeat of the Arabs in Israel's war of independence a foregone conclusion. To delve into this important chapter of history and to, to discuss the implications for the Middle East today, we're very pleased to have with him with us today as we take a deep dive into Palestine in the 1930s and the way the events he writes about determined so much of what followed. Orrin Kessler is a journalist and analyst living in Tel Aviv. Born in the United States, he has worked at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, the Henry Jackson Society in London, and as Arab affairs correspondent for the Jerusalem Post, as well as serving as an editor at Haaretz. He's been widely published in numerous outlets and is now the author of the new book, Palestine, by 1936. Orrin Kessler, welcome to Top Story. Thanks very much. Well, Oren, thanks for taking the time to talk to us today, and congratulations on what I think is an important work of history on a period that has not received uh, much attention from historians uh, in a field where there have been innumerable books published about other stages of the conflicts between Jews and Arabs in the last century. Let me start by asking you to explain to the audience in broad terms, what was the Great Revolt and what led to it? Um, yeah, again, uh, thanks so much for, for, uh, for having me to talk about, about this book. Uh, it's, um, you know, I discovered, uh, I, I, when I started writing this book, I, for some reason I had this idea that the world needed another book on the Israeli Palestinian conflict. And I was, <laughs> I was trying to find something that hadn't been written about, uh, to death. And, um, and I lit upon this, this topic that, uh, just, just struck me as incredibly, uh, incredibly formative, incre incredibly seminal, uh, not just for, for the Arabs of Palestine, but for, for, for the Jews and for, for the story of the state of Israel uh, and for the conflict itself and attempts to resolve the conflict. Um, and that it was populated by a lot of really fascinating, compelling, complex characters on all three sides. So Jewish, Arab and British. Um, and um, in terms of sort of the historical context leading up to the revolt, um, I think if I could just give a, a very quick express uh, version of, of the landmarks Thumbnail, of the mandate. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, I think many of your readers, probably your, your listeners all probably already know some of the important dates. But of course, 1917, the Balfour Declaration is, a, is of course, a key crucial date. That's a crucial year when the British... And uh, issue the Balfour Declaration, promising or declaring their support for the Jewish for a Jewish national home in Palestine. And of course, since then, there's been raucous debate about what does that mean? What is a national home? Is that a Jewish state? What does it mean in Palestine? Is that all of Palestine? Is that part of Palestine? What are the borders of Palestine? Um, and um, and then zooming right ahead, uh, Britain makes its Balfour Declaration, the World War I ends, and the League of Nations uh, grants Britain uh, a mandate over this land. And that's the result of some very effective uh, Zionist lobbying and also the work of a few friends in high places in London and elsewhere. Uh, and so the League of Nations, that's, uh, of course, this isn't just Britain, this is France, this is Italy, 
Uh, of course, notably, the U.S. was not part of the League of Nations because Congress rejected it. Uh, but the great powers of the time, the international community of the time, if you like, uh, grants its seal of approval to Britain, the country that gave the Balfour Declaration, having the mandate over Palestine. And the mandate text enshrines the Balfour Declaration right there in black and white in Article 2, that Britain shall uh, facilitate the immigration of Jews to this land and, quote, the close settlement of the land by Jews. So the twenties, uh, the twenties arrive. The, man, the Britain's military occupation is is supplanted by a civilian one, um, but there are several, and things are going well for the Jews. They're making they're making great strides economically, industrially, um, demographically, even. Uh, they're draining swamps, um, but of course, as often happens in this land, it's not there's there there's there's violence. There there are problems, and uh, notably in 1920 in 1921, and then famously and infamously in 1929. And I, I've, I've lost track of how many people, uh, when I start telling them about this book and this project, they say, oh, 1929, the Hebron massacre. And it's a, it's a different uh, incident. The, my book begins seven years after uh, the Hebron massacre. And, uh, you know, there's a book by Hillel Cohen, uh, Professor Hillel Cohen, called Year Zero, uh, 1929, Year Zero of the Israeli Arab conflict. And with no disrespect whatsoever to Professor Cohen, uh, in my view, uh, the, the gruesome riots of 1929, in which 133 Jews were killed over a matter of a few days in Hebron and elsewhere, those were, those were riots, those were acts of gruesome terrorism, but they were not a nationalist uh, uprising, a sustained nationalist uprising by the Arabs of this land. It wasn't uh, an intifada, as we, as we say today. The first time that anyone had seen anything on that scale uh, is 1936. Yeah, <clears throat> that's 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 exactly right. 1936 is the first organized Arab revolt. Now, the position of the Jewish community in Palestine in that era is generally portrayed in somewhat romantic fashion by the Jews and later generations of Israelis, and in the opposite way by the Arabs who see it as a sinister behemoth that it, they had no chance against. But what was the reality of Jewish life there at a time when Jews were still the minority? They were, as you say, recognized by the British, but in some ways still laboring under rules. I mean, you even note in your book in the opening chapters how the Western Wall was, you know, reflected that uh, the past that they were discriminated against, still considered by the Arabs, uh, you know, that it was a, an Arab shrine, a Muslim shrine, not a Jewish one. What What is Jewish life there like at this time? And is it still uh, essentially fragile or had it really dug into the point where the sort of Arab quest to reverse Zionism, you know, was was already a lost cause? So I would say the the the, the steady, the impressive gains that the, that the Jews made during the 20s, as I mentioned, economically and demographically and territorially, uh, they're really they really get turbocharged in the in the 30s. Um, of course, Hitler comes to power in 1933. But even elsewhere in Europe, in Poland, Hungary, Romania, anti-Semitic movements are, are on the rise. And, and Jewish immigration, the Jewish population of this land doubles in four years from 1931 to 1935. And that's partly due, that's of course due in large part to, to Hitler and these other anti-Semitic movements, but also there was a sympathetic high commissioner here in Jerusalem at the time by the name of Sir Arthur Walkup, and uh, immigration just went just just grew dramatically from year to year. In 1935, it was 60,000 Jews in a single year, um, and of course that represents uh, the backdrop to this revolt. It was very clear to the Arabs uh, that although the Jews were still a minority, they were less than a third at this point. That if things kept going this way. They would soon be 40 percent and 50 percent and, and they'd be a majority. Um, so in terms of your question about sort of who had the power, who was the stronger party, it's 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 a little difficult to say. It's 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 complicated because on the one hand, of course, the Arabs were still at least two thirds uh, of the population. On the other hand, the Jews, as as tends to happen in Jewish history, had outsized uh, economic clout and political clout, and they were much more organized. The Zionist movement and the Jews in general 
had the Histadrut Labor Federation, and they were just extremely, extremely organized. Um, and the Ar- Arab society was not. Arab society was was it was it was a it was, you know, this country was transformed or this land was transformed very quickly from a, a backwater of the Ottoman Empire to a little corner of the developed world. Um, and so uh, this is part of what sort of informed. I think a lot of British officials in this period felt that they had to sort of protect the Arabs from the Jews because the Jews were so dynamic and they were so ambitious and motivated um, and they had resources. They had help from from their brethren abroad. Um, it was not a picnic for the Jews by any by any means, but the, but things were moving so quickly. that I think a lot of the British thought that the Arabs had to be had to be helped in the face of these uh, these massive gains by the Zionist movement. Uh, Oren, um, as you say, the British played a somewhat equivocal role in this period. On the one hand, brutally repressing, repressing the Arab rebellion with some help from the Yishuv, but also moving towards a position in which they would ultimately betray their Balfour Declaration promises. And the question is, what explains the shift? You've just noted the way they felt that some in the British administration felt that they had to protect the Arabs from the Jews. But also, was it anti-Semitism a factor or was it also simply what they considered to be the geopolitical realities of the region on the eve of world of a world war where they felt appeasement of the Arabs was necessary? So I think my, my sense um, just from, from the archival record, as I, as I read it, my sense was that the average British official, certainly, certainly the lower level, the policemen and, and, and the troops, certainly tended the the norm was to identify with with the arabs that was the default position and i think that extended to the higher officialdom as well although i think the jews tended to have the the good fortune of always having one individual in a key position who who sympathized with them so these are people like winston churchill who of course was colonial secretary uh during a few years in 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 the 20s um and who, for much, was was really a lifelong uh, Zionist. Um, and these were these were men like Louis Andrews, who was the governor of Galilee, who was actually he was a Christian Zionist. Um, he was Australian, actually. Uh, he was one of very few uh, Brits in this country to learn Hebrew at a fairly high level. A fairly high level. He spoke very good Arabic as well. Uh, Louis Andrews was assassinated on his forty first birthday while going to church in. Uh, Nazareth by followers of Izzadin al Qassam, who whose name may be familiar to a lot of your listeners. Of course, that's that's the name of uh, Hamas's armed wing, uh, Hamas rockets that it fires at Israel. Uh, Izzadin al Qassam was a was a militant jihadist preacher in this time, um, who was killed by the British in 1935. Um, so so again, the, they, the Jews had that good fortune of having of having that one official uh, in the right place at the right time. And so um, I think there were, there, were, there were quite a few British officials who were a bit skeptical and suspicious of the whole uh, Zionist enterprise. And yet it went along, it kept, it kept chugging along through the 30s. Immigration was rising and rising uh, until this revolt broke out in 36. And uh, the Mufti, Haj Amin al-Husseini, uh, declared uh, well, rather, some Arab notables in Nablus declared a strike. And then a few days later, uh, at the very beginning of the revolt, Haj Amin Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who later would infamously uh, ally with Hitler at Hitler's side in Berlin during the Second World War. Um, Haj Amin declared that uh, the strike would be nationwide and it would go, um, it, would, it would last as long as um, Britain... Uh, refused to uh, until Britain gave three major concessions. So again, this is the Arab economy completely boycotting the British and the Jewish economy until three demands are met, namely a complete end to Jewish immigration, a complete ban on land land sales, because very many prominent and wealthy Arabs were selling uh, land to Jews, even while they railed against the practice uh, publicly. And then the third demand was uh, the establishment of a a legislature and an assembly uh, that would accurately reflect the demographics of the country, which, as I mentioned, were still about two thirds Arab. And um, and 
this strike really bore fruit because after a few months, um, the Brits send over uh, the Royal Commission, which we know as the Peel Commission, uh, which again, it's a, it's a, it's a, they produce a 400 page report, uh, which, you know, if anyone has a free uh, two weeks, I, I strongly recommend they read because it's a very good report. It's a very good read, uh, but it's known to history for its partition uh, recommendation, the last 10 or 15 pages or so in which we get the very first two state solution, if you like, uh, on the international agenda, a small Jewish state along the coast and in Galilee, and the rest, uh, an Arab state potentially attached to Transjordan. Uh, and of course, and the Jews debate, there's a raucous debate among the Zionists, whether to accept or not. Interestingly, uh, there's quite a lot of opposition on both left and right of the Zionist movement. It's not only uh, Jabotinsky, Vladimir Jabotinsky, head of the right wing revisionist Zionist camp who opposes that, although he does forcefully. Uh, there are also opponents on the left, on the Zionist left, who say this is a betrayal, who say the entire land is ours. Um, it was promised to us. Uh, but Ben-Gurion, David Ben-Gurion, who's far and away the undisputed leader of Palestine's Jews at this time, the Jews of the land of Israel, the Yeshuv, as we say in Hebrew, uh, and Chaim Weizmann, who's the head of the World uh, Zionist Organization, are both euphoric. They're both ecstatic. Even though they kind of play coy in public, they're both ecstatic by this proposal, which again came from the, from the British, not from the Jews. Uh, and they realize it's not the last word. They realize this is a foothold. This is a Jewish state, which, uh, you know, the mainstream Zionists hadn't dared utter those words to, in public, Jewish state. That was what Jabotinsky and the right-wing Zionists uh, talked about publicly. But uh, Ben-Gurion and Weizmann, would, especially Weizmann, was always very keen to put on a face of moderation. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I think a lot of people at this time thought the mandate might last for decades longer. Uh, but in any case, the Mufti rejects uh, the Jews accept the plan. The mainstream Zionists accept partition. The Mufti rejects it and the revolt starts up again. And this is when the British come in with very uh, heavy handed uh, measures. And yet they have uh, a problem. The, wind, the, the clouds of war are looming above Europe. It's, it seems to be a question of when and not if a, a war with Hitler will come. And uh, they can't afford to send large amounts of men to Palestine. So what do they do? They accede to a very long-standing Jewish demand to arm and train Jews in massive numbers. And this is really the start. This is, uh, th this is in many ways, the start of a, the, the beginning of a Jewish army. This is the beginning of the IDF because the Brits arm and train 15 or 20,000 Jews throughout this revolt. And they create a unit called the Jewish Supernumerary Police. In Hebrew, we say Notrim. And uh, these were officially, nominally, members of the Palestine police under British control. Uh, but as mentioned, they got their arms and their training and part of their salary from the British. And it was clear to everyone that they were actually answerable to the Haganah. And so by 1938-39, the Haganah has 25,000 men. And it goes from being a, a glorified uh, night watchmen's uh, a loose network of night watchmen to the seed of of the IDF, and then just getting to the white paper which you mentioned, um, or sorry, I should back up and say the British engage in extremely heavy-handed measures at this point, particularly after uh, the Munich crisis is averted. This is, of course, Neville Chamberlain is prime minister at this time, and uh, once Hitler is appeased at Munich and granted the Sudetenland. Then Britain can send over large amounts of manpower, which it does. It sends two divisions, 20,000 men. So this is mid to late uh, 1938. Um, and a lot of the most controversial methods that the IDF uses today and gets all kinds of international criticism for were actually begun by the British in this period. We're talking about home demolitions. 2,000 homes were demolished during this revolt. We're talking about uh, administrative detention namely detention without specific charges, um, curfews, uh, security barriers. Um, you know, the, the British put up a, a security barrier, a wall on the, on the border with Lebanon because there was so much militant activity coming down from Lebanon. There's an obvious parallel there with the West Bank uh, security barrier. Checkpoints, curfews, uh, 
collective punishment on a scale that the IDF would could never contemplate because it, I mean it's it, those things aren't done today. But uh, collective punishment was part of uh, part and parcel of the counterinsurgency, and so the British. Um, long story short, the British eventually wrestle uh, this revolt to the ground, uh, and yet they, the Chamberlain government uh, decides that it's appeasement policy. And of course, this was essentially its own stated policy. This wasn't just the word used by people like Winston Churchill, who opposed appeasement, uh, that their appeasement policy would have to extend to the Middle East as well, because those clouds of war were looming and it was becoming increasingly clear that war was on the horizon to everyone except perhaps Neville Chamberlain, who lived in some kind of fantasy land until well into uh, late 1939. Um, and, um, and so they call, they decided that, uh, and I have this in the cabinet papers, they talk about having to, quote, appease Arab and Muslim opinion and to go as far as they possibly could. And they were particularly worried about Muslim public opinion in India which, of course, at this time includes Pakistan, and it's what we now call Pakistan and its large uh, Muslim population. They were extremely worried that the large Muslim population of India, if they were angry about Palestine, would not be uh, on board with Britain during the war, and that Muslim opinion had to be appeased. So the Brits being the Brits, they call a conference. They had an endless uh, appetite for conferences and commissions, uh, and so they call a conference in London, but the die is essentially cast. It's already fairly clear what's going to happen at this conference. The only question is how far will they go in the direction of Palestinian and Arab demands? And in the end, they go quite a bit farther than they had even planned to. And I have, I've, you know, I've read all of the cabinet papers and all of the wrangling um, before and during this conference. And as far as they planned to go before the conference, which was quite far, they go quite a bit farther. And the result is the infamous white paper of 1939, in which Jewish immigration to this land is uh, is cut down dramatically to a grand total of 75,000 over five years. And if we remember that in 1935, 60,000 Jews came to this land. Now we're talking about 75,000 over five years, spread over five years at the time when, of course, the Jews need a sanctuary more than ever before. Uh, and then after those five years, any further immigration would be contingent on Arab consent. And of course, it was clear to everyone, Arab, Jew, and Britain alike, that if it was contingent on Arab consent, it wasn't going to happen. And then uh, that there would be no more, more immigration. And that this country, uh, the white paper also calls for after that five year, five or 10 year period uh, for this country to become independent. And it didn't say independent, independent Arab state, but again, it was fairly evident to everyone that a country that that had a, 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 a still a strong Arab majority and was prevented and in which Jews were prevented uh, from coming, that that would be a de facto Arab state. So really, this is uh, this is a betrayal. This is a, a, a reneging on uh, on the Peel proposal. Clearly, this is a reneging on partitioning the land, but it's also a reneging on the Balfour Declaration itself. And that's how uh, the Jews saw it. They saw it as a tremendous betrayal. I think a lot of um, there was actually a lot of international sympathy uh, for the Jews at this for the, the, the for, for the Jews at this of, of, of this land at that time, um, given the Hitler menace and given the fact that it was a, just a clear reversal of everything uh, that had been promised 20 years before. And, you know, a promise on which the Jews built so much. Right. They, the, the, the Jews invested so much in this land based on this promise that that that. Uh, that immigration and development would 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 be allowed to uh, to continue, but for the British, it was a matter of uh, of, of real politic. Right. I think we should take a moment to discuss, e even if only very briefly, the terms we use to describe the groups involved in the conflict in this period. Um, it was the Jews who called themselves Palestinians, but you argue rather persuasively that it was this time and this conflict that solidified the idea of a separate national identity for Arabs living in what was then the British mandate, as opposed to merely thinking of themselves as part of a broad Arab nation that stretched across today's political boundaries. Why did Palestinian national identity come into existence, if only as a force to oppose Zionism at this moment? So, yeah, I, I should note that, you know, I think um, 
the 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 p word in the, in in my title i think for for some of some of us who consider ourselves friends of israel that can be a loaded word even a, a triggering word uh you know, i think there's there's maybe a an idea these days that Palestine is an Arab word the way that uh, or an Arabic word the way that Israel is a, a Hebrew Jewish word. But if, but I'm not using it in this in this title or in this book in any kind of polemical or political way. It's simply what this country was called in English at the time, including by the Jews. Of course, in Hebrew, they would say Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. Uh, but the official English name was 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 Mandate Palestine. Um, and it's true. The term Palestinian and I and I make sure to do this in the book i until before 48 at least i i don't use in the book palestinian just to uh just to refer to palestinian arabs because it's um it's anachronistic at this time if you were to say palestinian it could refer to to jews or to arabs when weizmann who was based mostly in london talked about ben gurion and others who lived here you would talk about them as the palestinians right and when um, and so I would typically only use Palestinian per se uh, for the Arab side if we're talking about Iraqis and Palestinians, Egyptians and Palestinians, but if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it was at this time, the, the terms would have been the, the Jews of Palestine, the Arabs of Palestine, the Palestinian Jews, the Palestinian Arabs. Um, but yeah, this is certainly an extremely formative chapter in the history of of um of palestinian uh yeah of palestinian nationalism this is this is the moment this is this is the moment in which all of society or most of society urban and rural uh, rich and poor rival families even even christian and muslim to an extent unite behind uh, the mufti uh at least at first against a common foe namely the British Empire and 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 Zionism, right? The British Empire was seen as the the handmaiden of, of Zionism, essentially. Um, and if they could bring down the, the British rule, they would bring down Zionism as well. Um, but it's extremely it's extremely seminal and decisive for the Arabs of this country, and it's when they kind of come to it's the cru I write that it's the crucible in which um, you know nothing nothing brings the people together like a common enemy. We've seen this uh, throughout history. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's it's extremely uh, formative for for that side, for the Arab side, but also for the Jews, for the Zionist community, the Yishuv. Um, this is uh, it's not only the military transformation that it that it undergoes that I mentioned, but there's an economic transformation. Ben Gurion was a, a genius at turning adversity into advantage, and he saw in this revolt, despite all the pain and despite all the bloodshed, you know, 500 Jews were killed in this revolt. You know, this was a, these, these are huge numbers that we didn't see until, you know, the second intifada um, and a thousand wounded. But despite all of that pain and all of that bloodshed, Ben Gurion saw a, a golden opportunity to, to realize one of his long-term goals, which was uh, to create an, a self-sufficient Jewish economy. This is when, uh, you know, this is when Tel Aviv port is born. That's the Just irony of, of yeah. Right. That's the irony of the Arab boycott in that right. that actually helps the Jews. It doesn't hurt them. Absolutely. It really does. Um, so, yes, Tel Aviv port, you know, so uh, Ben Gurion talked about Tel Aviv port as if it's a second Balfour declaration. You know, this is our outlet to the world. Um, you know, uh, agriculture, industry, everything is is really booming at this in this stage. Um, and um, and of course, the Arab economy is completely gutted by this by this uh, boycott. But even I argue in the book that militarily, economically, uh, strategically and territorially, um, even psychologically, this is a transformative period for the Jews. There's a there's a, a book by the Israeli historian Anita Shapira in which uh, called Land and Power, in which she talks about the shift from a defensive ethos to an offensive ethos in, in Zionist thinking. And if the, if the offensive ethos had previously been confined to perhaps Jabotinsky and the Irgun and the more right-wing side of the Zionist movement, I think in this period, Ben-Gurion and the mainstream, quote-unquote, Zionists, the Jewish agency, their views started to look a lot more, their views on the Arab question started to look a lot more like the Jabotinskyite's views. There's another academic book on Zionist thinking in this period that's called The Abandonment of Illusions. And I think uh, 
in this period, the kind of illusions uh, or hopes that many, many Jews here had entertained, that if we just show that there's room for everyone, if we just show the Arabs that we're bringing blessings and that we can increase, we can show them how to increase their agricultural yield. And, um, you know, we can bring the blessings of modernity and drain swamps that they'll realize um, the benefits that we're bringing and they won't oppose us. I think those notions or those illusions were, were dashed at this period. And there was a realization that the, the, the fate of this country would be determined and maintained uh, by force. And this is when this is the moment at which the kind of the Zionist pedestal, uh, which had held up the Hebrew worker and the Hebrew farmer and the Hebrew pioneer, uh, now finds room for the, the Hebrew fighter and the Hebrew warrior. Um, and I think just just finally, I think much of the, the springboard and all those ways I mentioned, military, strategic, demographic, the springboard, uh, the, the basis for the state of Israel is really uh, for the Jewish state is really laying uh, 10 years before when we typically, you know, we typically think of 48 as really the genesis of, of everything of the, of, of the Jewish state. And, uh, but really the, the, that I argue that the, the, the basis and the springboard for that Jewish, for that Jewish state was actually laid and ready 10 years beforehand. And in many ways, the war between Jews and Arabs, uh, here was, was, was already won by the Jews, at least the, the civil war part of it and lost by the Arabs in this, in this period. You know, the, the Palestinians could not be persuaded to abandon their national ambitions for a solution that made economic or geopolitical sense. But there were some Arabs earlier in the struggle who might have considered compromise. But by the late 1930s, there was not much of an Arab constituency for coexistence with the Jewish state or proto-state. Why do you think it was impossible and how much... I guess, you know, bringing us, start to bring us, you know, into today, how much has the same mindset influenced the failure to make peace in the last three decades since Oslo? Because some of the same dynamics are sort of still in place, aren't there? Yeah, absolutely. And there was, at this time, there was a, the main rivalry among the Palestinians. You could almost compare it to the to the Fatah-Hamas rivalry, I suppose, uh, was between the Muftis camp, the Husseini camp, and then the Nashashibi camp. Um, Raghav Nashashibi was a former mayor of Jerusalem himself. And uh, the Nashashibis were typically considered the more moderate camp, the more willing to work with the Zionist movement. Um, in fact, when the, when the partition plan uh, was presented, there were a number of prominent, uh, prominent Arabs, almost entirely in the Nashashibi camp, um, who accepted it. The mayor, there, there were a few, I believe the mayor of Gaza accepted it. He was, a, he was in the Nashashibi camp. Uh, the mayor of Jaffa, if I'm not mistaken. And of course, um, excuse me, the Emir uh, Abdullah of Transjordan, who was also kind of affiliated with the Nashashibis. He, well, he was actually the only prominent Arab who supported it uh, publicly. And that was largely for self-interested reasons, because he wasn't quite content with his rather sparsely populated desert realm. And he wanted uh, what we now call what we now call the West Bank and uh, the eastern part of um of of Palestine, um, and so there there was uh, there were elements within Arab society who they were not exactly uh, lovers of Zion, perhaps, but they were willing to work with the Jews, and they were they and they could see the benefits that the Jews uh, were bringing. But the Mufti uh, made very clear that that his was the only way, as as the revolt uh, as the revolt dragged on. Uh, you know the the level of Arab infighting was 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 uh, just immense. There was there was a tremendous amount of score settling, and uh, you know the the elimination of enemies, real and perceived, certainly by the Mufti and his henchmen, but by others as well. And uh, and this is really a precursor to what we see in the first Intifada and 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 mainly in the and and, and mainly in the second Intifada. Um, you know there's. A, by the end of this revolt, far more Arabs are dying at Arab hands than at than at British hands, uh, let alone Jewish hands. Um, and uh, of you know, the Arab death toll was probably about five thousand, maybe even eight thousand. So at least ten times that of the Jews, and at least fifteen hundred or two thousand of those, maybe maybe many more, uh, were killed by their fellow Arabs. So this is just one way in which one one rather 
sad and tragic way in which uh, on the Palestinian side, uh, this revolt was a precursor to things to come uh, much later. One of the really stark conclusions you draw about the conflict is that it rendered um, the more well-known battle in 1947-48, which we know of as Israel's War of Independence, a foregone conclusion, at least as far as the Palestinian Arabs were concerned. Now, you acknowledge that at the end of the Great Revolt, the Arabs achieved their greatest triumph in terms of influencing the British with Neville Chamberlain's decision to appease them after trying to do the same with Hitler with a white paper. But why did this effort also effectively seal their doom a decade later when the conflict in Palestine resumed? I mean, there's a certain irony there, isn't it? Yeah, and I should mention that once the revolt, uh, the second phase of the, once the revolt is renewed after that assassination of that high level official uh, in late 37, uh, once that once the revolt is renewed, the Mufti becomes a wanted man and uh, he holds up in the on the Temple Mount or as he would say, on the Haram al-Sharif. And uh, because he knows, he suspects correctly that the British won't dare offend Muslim sensibilities by, uh, by going there. And there's some parallels there uh, to today as well. Um, and, uh, and he eventually flees to, to Jaffa port dressed as a, a Bedouin. And he uh, takes a boat and ends up uh, outside of Beirut. And he sets up outside of Beirut, but continues to pull the strings uh, of the revolt from Beirut. It's really, it's evident to, to British intelligence. It's evident to the nascent Jewish Haganah intelligence. It's evident to the Arabs that the Mufti, may, although he may not be planning every attack, he is guiding the revolt along its main path, both inciting it, but also uh, directing um, arms and money. Um, and... Um, and so really, when, when the white paper is passed, there's, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of support in high-level Arab circles for the white paper, uh, but, not, but not on the part of the mufti. The mufti, as, as, is, as was his want, rejected it. I think in large part he rejected it because the British wouldn't allow him to come back here as a, as, as a, vi as a victorious conquering hero. Uh, but he rejected it. And yet uh, the British still went along with it. The white, uh, the white paper was still implemented, even though the, 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 the leader of the Arabs of Palestine uh, rejected it. But uh, he was essentially, in British eyes, damaged goods at this point. And this was even before he went, uh, went and joined a pro-fascist uh, coup in Iraq and then made his way through fascist Italy to, to Nazi Germany. Um, and so... This was uh, unfortunately for for the uh, unfortunately for the Palestinians and unfortunately for us on the other side, uh, the Mufti's failures during the revolt and the Mufti's disgraceful behavior during the Second World War at Hitler's side, none of these unfortunately were enough to convince Palestinians that uh, that he was bad news, that he was damaged goods, and that he was hurting their cause. It was really only in 1948 with uh, the, the rout of the Palestinians and their, their, their resounding loss and defeat and their, and their dispersal of many of them, it was only then that Palestinians realized what a disaster he had been. Uh, and you'll notice that today, there are no schools named for the Mufti. There are no roads named for the Mufti. You may have soccer stadiums named for, for various terrorists and militants from from the 80s or from the 30s uh you know there are militant leaders from this period who are still celebrated in the palestinian discourse the mufti is is greeted with you know embarrassed silence if anything because he uh the palestinians realized i think belatedly that he had been a disaster for them yeah let's turn for a moment back to how the jews are dealing with this now this is during this period, um, the concept of havlaga or self-restraint in terms of the Jewish community and how they should react to, you know, Arab attacks on, on them. Um, that continues today, as we can see in the reactions to Arab terrorism in our own day. Uh, the correlations of forces are different from when the Jews began their first attempts at retaliation for being terrorized. But in some ways, 
it's kind of the same debate. I mean, even to, you know, the events of, of the week in which we're sitting here talking, where Jews responded to, you know, a terrorist attack by attacking an Arab village. Um, this is this is when that debate about how Jews should respond to terrorism begins, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, the the Irgun militia that I mentioned earlier, the sort of right wing uh, Jabotinsky militia had a very uh, had a very different view than the than the Ben Gurion uh, leadership, the Ben Gurion led uh, leadership, the labor leadership. Uh, the Irgun basically believed in uh, an eye for an eye, and that Jewish blood should not go uh, unavenged, and uh, and they also believed that by taking by by going on the offensive against against Arabs, including Arab civilians, uh, that they would deter further attacks on on Jews. So we, the kind of thing that we saw over the last few days in, in Hawara, we, did, we didn't see exactly that kind of thing in the 1930s because the British would have put an end to that very quickly. But certainly we saw, starting in late 1937, uh, the Irgun again and again uh, take, take the fight to take the fight to to the Arabs again, uh, to militants in certain cases, but very often to civilians, uh, as we saw in Hawara. So yeah, in many ways, uh, you know, in many ways things are things are different. The Jews have an army now, a very powerful army, and uh, you know, it's hard for me the, the 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 kind of key event, the 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 event that really sparks the the revolt is uh well first it's the the assassination of Qassam in late 35 but then in April on April 19th 1936 you have what's called the bloody day in Jaffa that's what the press called it at the time in which 16 Jews are killed in various spots in Jaffa and South Tel Aviv over two days now we certainly have we still have a terrorism problem in this country clearly but it's very difficult for me to imagine that kind of thing happening now for example now if somebody uh, maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but I think now if, if a Palestinian decides to gun down a Jew in, 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 on the streets, you know, his, his, his chances of survival are not particularly high. And at the very least, uh, usually they're captured fairly, fairly quickly. It's a very different power dynamic um, now. And yet those sort of ideological uh, debates about reprisal, about restraint are in many ways the same debates of 80 some years ago. Yeah, the, the same kind of debates, even with the British, about how best to suppress terrorism. The British, as, as you earlier said, are very heavy handed and involve and, and use draconian methods against um, the Arabs that Israel today wouldn't even contemplate. But again, it's a question of what, what works, what doesn't work. Um, I think some might say that the, you know, the British success was because they were so brutal, but it didn't necessarily end the conflict. Now, you, you also draw some really interesting um, uh, portraits of the personalities in the conflict. We can we can only scratch the surf, surface of them. Uh, some of them, whom you tell us a lot about in the book, like Musa Alami, aren't well known. But of course, one on the Arab side that is still a focus of interest, as you just were telling us about, is Hajamin al Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem. Now, you've told us a little bit about how important he was to the events of 1936 to 1939, as well as decades later. And I guess the follow-up question to that is, do you think his activities during World War II, when he you know, was a guest of Hitler and ally of the Nazis, you know, there are some who say that this tells us a lot about Palestinian nationalism. Others say it was just an accident of history, that he was just looking for an ally. You know, but this goes to sort of a debate on the Jewish side: is what is the nature of 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 our opponents? Um, how much should um, the story of the Mufti inform our ideas about Palestinian nationalism? It's a good question. Uh, it's not an easy question. Um, it's uh, on the one hand, the Mufti enjoyed. At least in the begin in the in the early phases of the revolt, he enjoyed tremendous support. I think, I think that deteriorated to a to a to a large extent as the revolt wore on and and these, as the acts these acts of score settling uh, mounted. And yet, nobody dared really criticize him in public. There was one member of the Nashashibi 
clan, a guy named Fakhri Nashashibi, who came out and said, this is, this is a terrorist. This is, this is an extremist. We, we, need, we need to get, uh, to, to get other leaders. And unsurprisingly, he didn't live very long. He was, he was uh, assassinated in, in Baghdad in 1941. Um, and so uh, it's, there's the, it's very difficult to, to sugarcoat the fact that even after aligning with Hitler, um, the Mufti remained the undisputed leader of, of the Palestinians. And even and Musa Alami, who you mentioned, who really was, was by all accounts a man of moderate disposition, he didn't break with the Mufti either until 1948. So uh, it's, it's, um, it's not an easy thing to, to wrap one's head around. Uh, I think it's a good thing that he's been uh, marginalized in, Palestinian, in the Palestinian consciousness. But again, I can't escape the conclusion that it was that he was marginalized because of the losses of 1948 and not for uh, sitting by Hitler's side during the Second World War. It's difficult to get around that uh, fairly obvious fact. Yeah, and I think even going beyond his support for the Nazis and his attempt to really aid Hitler, um, which again is a matter of you know it, how important it is um, is is debated by some, but it's the tone of extremism. It's the unwillingness to to sort of even con contemplate any kind of compromise, and and indeed the denial of Jewish rights. Anywhere in you know in the world, I mean, when when the Mufti you know uh, testifies before the Peel Commission, as you relate in your book, you know he talks about how the Western Wall is simply a Muslim shrine and has nothing to do with the Jews. Um, that has its echoes in today's political rhetoric among the Palestinians too, doesn't it? Yeah, I think I think it is fair to say that 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 um, you could you could certainly draw some parallels between the Mufti and and Yasser Arafat if we wanted to uh, just in terms of uh, not brooking dissent, uh, in terms of uh, certain fundamental extremism, willingness to use terrorism. There's there there, there are a lot of there are a lot of parallels there. Um, I, I I think it's it's a it's a fair reading of history to say that even though uh, the Mufti is as I mentioned marginalized in, in Palestinian thinking today that he has, has kind of left his stamp on much of uh, much of the more militant parts of the Palestinian discourse. I think that's that's correct. And I think, you know, one of the fascinating things that we that we really think about is that it was the British, of course, who appointed the Mufti to his position. It didn't have to and a be a British Jew, not just the British, a, a British zoo, a British Jew, a British Jew. Zionist. Uh, yeah, Jew. I'm sorry, did I say zoo? Herbert Samuel, uh, a British, <laughs> a British Jew, and a British uh, Zionist by the name of Herbert Samuel, who was the first High Commissioner of Palestine, and who uh, was who was a, a, a very important early Zionist. He actually put the he put sort of Zionism on the on the cab on the British cabinet table before anyone was thinking about it. Quite a bit before the the, uh, the Balfour Declaration, um, and. Uh, and I actually found in my um, one of the most interesting things that I found in this re research are the secret testimonies of the Peel uh, Commission, which uh, were supposed to have been disposed of or burned. But somebody, one British official, tucked them away uh, for posterity and they were declassified only in 2017. So 80 years after. And Herbert Samuel is one of the people who uh, testifies there. And it was really uh fascinating to see because he was asked he was asked about his appointment of the mufti and he sort of deflects and justifies himself and said that uh, there was no one else who had the requisite qualifications because it had to be a husseini for various reasons and uh, had, and amin had studied at al azhar etc cetera, etc cetera. um there's no real uh reckoning with the tremendous negative effects of that choice we can only imagine what would have happened here had somebody else been given that tremendous power? Uh, he was both Grand Mufti of Jerusalem and head of the Supreme Muslim Council. So he really had, there was no one who rivaled him in, 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 in power in Arab Palestine. Yeah. That one other sort of counterfactual, if we will, that you do allude to toward, towards the end of the book is the question of that tiny Jewish state that the Peel Commission envisioned in 1936. And if 
by some way the British had been able to impose that solution on 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 the land, could that have averted the deaths you know of the Holocaust, saved many Jews in the Holocaust? Um, tell us where you come down on that, because that that's kind of an important piece of Zionist historiography, isn't it? What if there had been a Jewish state before, you know, the World War II? Absolutely, and uh, and I think it was it was Golda Meir who said after World War II that had um, had there been a Jewish state in 1937 that six million Jews wouldn't have been killed; they would have been living in Palestine, and it, it's it's possible. I think. I'm a little skeptical that that there that six million could have been saved because I for one thing I'm not sure this country could have absorbed that many people in the, in that in the, in such a short period and I also think many Jews simply couldn't fathom what was in store and many of them wouldn't have come here even if they could um, before the war but I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that had there been a Jewish state in 1937 or had the British not passed the White Paper in 1939. Hundreds of thousands of Jews could have been could have been saved and could have been taken in here. I think I think that's a plausible uh, estimate. So it's uh, in many ways it was it was rather tragic reading this, especially with the white paper, reading the bureaucratic wrangling on the on the and and horse trading on the on the British side uh, and then in the British cabinet, knowing that they're that they're playing with the lives of 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 millions of people i mean the the colonial secretary at the time was a guy named malcolm mcdonald who was younger than me he was 37 and uh and you know this this white paper is known as the mcdonald white paper and it was also quite fascinating and sad and tragic to read his reckoning in hindsight with 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 his role in history and um and, uh, he never quite accounts, renounced it, though. He he never really owned up to say, you know, I I was wrong. He kept yeah. saying it was he, you know, to to his to his uh, to the end of his life, he kept saying, well, I I did exactly what I I had to do, even if it was tragic. He said, and he also said, uh, you know, I was just a young guy, and I was doing what uh, I was working based on the advice that I had. But he does admit the closest thing he comes to admitting um, any culpability. For, for essentially shuttering the gates of this country to, to Jews in their hour of need, the closest he comes is to say, well, uh, it's true that we went a bit farther uh, towards the Arab, in the Arab direction than we would have based on the merits of the case. That's as far as he'll go. He basically said, you know, the, the, the exigencies, the circumstances of the time meant we had to go even further than the merits that we saw in the Arab case, which is not exactly... Uh, not exactly a mea culpa, but um, by most accounts, by the accounts of his friends, he, he essentially never wanted to talk about that period. Um, it's, it's tragic. It's tragic. It's extremely sad. <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of comparing things, um, how would you compare the impact of the Great Revolt to the Second Intifada in terms of its impact on both Palestinian society and politics, as well as sort of um, you know, sort of killing remote prospects for peace because in some ways there are parallels because both conflicts you know resulted in real devastation for for the Palestinians and and no political progress I think in many ways you can you can compare the first phase of the revolt that first six month phase leading to Britain sending the Peel Commission in in certain ways you can compare that to the first Intifada of 1987 because both of them really brought tangible gains to the Palestinians. In, in the 30s, they, they got the Peel Commission, as I mentioned. And in the, in the 80s, this is really what started. This is what launched the Madrid uh, peace process. And then later, the Oslo Accords. This was, this was prompted by the Intifada in many ways, whereas the second Intifada looks a lot more like the second phase of the revolt in just the sort of nihilistic, internecine fighting. Uh, you know, the, the second Intifada brought no tangible gains to the Palestinians. It brought tremendous loss of life upon them, both at the hands of the IDF and at the hands of their, their fellow Arabs. Um, it severely restricted their movement into Israel. It's, it's very difficult to point, for, if you're trying to look from a Palestinian perspective, it's very difficult to point to any gains from the Second Intifada. Uh, so, yeah, so it's, in that sense, it's a kind of, it's a very discouraging and, 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 and tragic template that was set 
in the 1930s of of violence both against Jews and among themselves that doesn't even doesn't even lead to any kind of diplomatic uh, gains. Yeah. As we've noted, um, this period produced an early two-state solution scheme, which failed, as have all the others that followed. I think you've explained to us why that idea failed then, but we see so much of the same dynamic playing out uh, you know, in the last two decades or three decades in terms of Palestinian disunity and in a preference for ideological posturing over state building. Um, we mentioned Jabotinsky before he wrote this famous Iron Wall essay that predicted that the conflict would continue until the Arabs conceded defeat in their war on Zionism. It's debatable whether that moment has come even after all this time, but are Jews and Arabs really any closer to that kind of compromise today than they were in the 1930s? It's a very good question. I think sometimes I, it, 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 sometimes I think that... Um, Within Israel proper, I think in many ways, um, uh, this is kind of a half-baked theory, so work, work with me here. But uh, I think within Israel proper, in many ways, the, the, the Arab Israelis have kind of fulfilled the vision that Jabotinsky had of, the, of how, how it would work to be an Arab in the Jewish state. Of course, there have been problems between Jews and Arabs in this country. We only have to think about May 2021. But... Jabotinsky believed that the Arab citizens of the Jewish state, although they wouldn't be Zionists, they would, for the most part, they would see the benefits that 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 citizenship in the Jewish state would bring, and that for the most part, Jews and Arabs would find a, a modus vivendi. The Palestinians are a different. It's the Palestinians across the Green Line are uh, a different a different story. It's very difficult to have any optimism. Uh, about any kind of resolution anytime soon. Uh, interestingly, it was that same Herbert Samuel who uh, who was kind of considered on the, very much on the Zionist left um, and who actually was not necessarily opposed to limiting, to setting an upper limit on Jewish immigration. That same Herbert Samuel was against partition. He said, this, this land is too small to partition. It's impossible. You can't do it. There's no, there's no physical barriers. The obvious physical barrier is the Jordan River. And beyond that, it's, it's simply impossible. Um, so the, the hurdles are as high as they've ever been uh, to partitioning this land. Uh, it, to any kind of plan of division would depend on uh, massive amounts of goodwill from each side to the other. And it's very difficult to see, um, <laughs> to, 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 see, uh, to see that at the moment. Uh, so, no, I can't say I'm particularly optimistic uh, of any uh, kind of resolution anytime soon. Although, you know, from a, from a Jewish or an Israeli perspective, I think if you look at the period of this book and you compare it to today, I think there's a tremendous amount to be proud and optimistic about. In the period that I'm writing about, the, the Ben-Gurion and Weizmann couldn't have imagined, they, in their wildest dreams, they talked about um, a million, a million and a half Jews here one day. And now we've got how many? Seven, six, seven? Mm -hmm. uh, seven million, you know, yeah. Yeah, we've got, you know, here in, in the state of Israel, we've got a, a GDP that's, that a per capita GDP that's higher than that of, of Britain, of the empire that, <laughs> that, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, allowed us to, to allow the Jews to come here and, and make a stab at it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, we Jews tend to, tend to have, um, tend to have a long understanding of, of history. We tend to view history in, in centuries. Uh, so I think if we're, if we're looking for a, you know, a ray of light and a bit of, uh, hope, I think, uh, I think th there's a lot to be proud of in this country that, uh, that the Jews of the 1930s could never have imagined. Yeah. Well, I think that's very true. The perspective of uh, 2023 to 1936 or 1939, you know, it's an enormous change. Uh, Israel's uh, regional military superpower and a first world economy, uh, not uh, a people struggling for their lives, even though the danger still persists. Uh, Oren, thanks so much for coming on today and for your insights on both the history of the conflict and what is happening today. 
Uh, good luck with your book, which is, I think, an important addition to the literature on the conflict and which uh, anyone who really cares about the history of Israel and Zionism ought to read. We also want to thank our audience. Please remember to tune in every day for Top Story Daily Edition. And whether you're listening to us on Spotify or any of the other podcast platforms or watching us live on Fight Facebook or Twitter or on the JNS YouTube channel or on JBS TV, Please like and or subscribe to Top Story, click on the bell for notifications, and give us good reviews. Please write to us at editor at jns.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself, and we'll see you again next week.